So thank you for the nice introduction. Um, yes, I'm a data scientist or software engineer at Blue Yonder. Uh, in my day-to-day -day work, uh, I work a lot with Python. I work with SQL. Um, I'm responsible for the databases in our company. Um, you can find this, the slides of the talk and some other stuff, um, some software that we have open sourced in our GitHub repository at Blue Yonder on GitHub. Um, when I'm not working, um, I still like to fiddle around with Python and the Python community because I really like the community. Um, so I became one of the co-organizers of PyCon DE 2017 and 2018. Um, also a co-founder and co-organizer of the Pay Data uh, Karlsruhe group, um, we just started, so we um, are a small group at the moment, but we really plan uh, to become bigger. Um, so before I go into my talk, uh, let's pitch a little bit the conference. Um, we'll have uh, the second time in a row the Pi Data in Karlsruhe, uh, that's in southern Germany, um, near to the Black Forest. Um, it's always a combined event. It's a Pi Data with a Pi, uh, other PyCon DE with a Pi Data track. Um, last year uh, we had uh, about um, 450 people there. Uh, we had three uh, tracks uh, with talks, one track uh, with tutorials. Um, we had a really nice venue with the Center for Art and Media in Karlsruhe. So here are some impressions. Um, we had great keynotes. Uh, we talked about the universe and how it is made of and what it is made from. Um, we had in parallel the great art um, exhibition, The Open Codes, and we had another great keynote speaker, which I was very proud of, uh, the founder of Dask, uh, Matthew Rocklin. Um, so probably if you think last year we had Matthew Rocklin, and my talk is about Dask and Pandas, so probably who would be uh, the nice keynote speaker for this year. Um, so that's brand news. Um, we have gotten Wes McKinney as a keynote, speak keynote speaker, so he's the founder of Pandas. Uh, he is a PMC member at Apache Arrow and Parquet, so that's what I'm talking about. And yeah, he is also with the Apache Software Foundation, so I'm very proud uh, that we have um, got him as a keynote speaker because it touches lots of area that we do in the company and I'm personally interested in. Um, we have already so uh, sold 150 tickets, so if you are interested, uh, you really should hurry up because once we are um, getting a schedule out, um, yeah, the tickets will just go uh, by with a blink of an eye, um, and we expect to be sold out uh, once we um, push, the, um, push the talks out. So let's uh, come back to my talk. Um, today I will talk about uh, columnar data in Apache Parquet and how we use Pandas and Dask uh, to work with it. Um, API-wise, um, there's not that much in Pandas and Dask to work with it, um, but I will uh, tell you a little bit more um, about um, the challenges and the motivations we had in our software architecture um, to, that we need to change, um, and then we came uh, to the conclusion that Apache, Apache Parquet is a, a nice storage techno technology for us, and um, I will show how we use Pandas in Dask to work with it and how it improved um, our architecture in our company. So uh, what do we do at uh, Blue Under? We are a machine learning company. Uh, we work in the retail space. Um, so our business model is that the customer, that's a big retail chain, uh, a chains, uh, they send us their customer data, so mostly sales and stocks and product information and store information. Um, we put all this data in a big uh, SQL database. Um, then we have our machine learning algorithms. Um, they we train it on the historical data, and then we can make uh, predictions for the future about future sales in different stores. And then we use uh, this uh, probably density function um, to uh, build replenishment on top of it. So we tell um, supply chains every day, um, you need to order for this store this amount uh, uh, of products for the next day um, so that you are not going out of stock and you are not having too much waste. Um, that's our business model. Um, we work uh, quite with quite some data. Um, we use mostly supervised regression um, for our models. Um, so we have um, we get lots of data from the customer, but we have also um, some other additional data sources like events or weather data. 
and based on that, that we basically build a huge matrix um, with features for each product, location, uh, and date combination. And we use the historical uh, values to train our data, uh, to train our models, and then uh, run on a daily basis our machine learning pipeline to uh, each day generate new uh, sales forecasts. Um, I'm not going uh, any more into the machine learning today. Um, the only thing that is important, so uh, normally we have historical data from our clients about three to five years, and that's up to um, 100 billion records, so that's uh, quite some stuff. Uh, let's look uh, at, maybe if you go back one or two years in time, uh, so how was our data flow uh, at our company? So uh, we had this, or we have this huge clusters um, uh, of in-memory columnar distributed SQL uh, databases. Um, it's a proprietary uh, software called Exasol. We normally run this with four to eight nodes, database clusters, and it keeps all the, uh, the, uh, the data in memory. Um, so the customer sends us data every day. Uh, we put it into the, the database. Um, then we have a machine learning cluster based on Apache Mesos and Aurora. Uh, we run open source software like Jupyter, Dask, or Pandas on top of it. We pull the data out uh, again from the Exasol, from the database, uh, do the machine learning, uh, and after this um, we insert it back in the database, and then the customer uh, pulls it uh, from the database. Um, to give you some numbers, um, if we calculate uh, predictions for a typical kill re uh, retailer, uh, that's about 20,000 products, um, about 500 stores, and we calculate 20 days of horizon. So we calculate each day uh, 20 millions of decisions um, for each day for each customer. And all this data has to go out of the exit, out of the database, and go, go back uh, into the database again. So that's where we already see uh, where we have a bottleneck. Uh, on the one side, uh, we can really uh, trivial parallelize um, our machine learning algorithms based on clustering on product groups or locations. So we really can scale this out to 500 workers with no problems. But in front, um, we have this database where we can at max um, pull out data with 10 or 15 connections, um, and then the data database um, is on full load. And even worse, um, we want to insert back the data into the database because of full table logs. We only can insert with one um, connection at a time. Um, we are inserting with, with about 25,000 rows a second. Uh, if you calculate it up, um, we already use about two hours only to get the data back into the database. Um, if you're working in the retail space um, and you look at the operations clock from a typical retailer, um, two hours delay because we need to get all the data in the database, um, that's a huge amount of time for them. So we figured out, okay, we need to go better, uh, we need to be better. Um, our conclusion was always um, Python is a really uh, good companion for the data scientists. They are really happy with it. Um, they like to build um, Data, uh, data models, all the stuff, they really like it. Um, but it has not been the best uh, to move uh, large data in and out. Um, so uh, why do I care or what do we think about? Um, most of uh, our data um, are huge time series. Um, they do not necessarily uh, need to be in a database. So we would really like to, uh, to have this time series uh, in a distributed file system with a non-uniform schema. Um, we like to execute queries on top of it, um, but most of the time we are only interested in a subset of the data and not all the data. Um, there are lots um, of technologies out there that work very nice um, with this kind uh, of constraints, but they are mostly um, in the Java ecosystem, so they are not uh, available in Python, like Pesto or Impala or Drill. Um, so that's amazing that they are av available in Java, um, but we needed something um, that's available in Python to really get our data in and out. Um, so the obvious solution for us was two years ago, okay, let's uh, look into a parquet uh, as a file format and look into a blob storage as a storage technology um, to get the data better into our uh, machine learning pipelines. 
Um, two years ago, uh, there was uh, not a really good uh, Parquet library for Python, um, or with some uh, work from us and others, this has changed, so we are really happy with this. Um, before this was a, or this is a general problem in all, all languages if you want to access um, data, data, or data formats, um, you have often very good interoperability within your AI, AI ecosystem. So in the Python world, it's uh, mostly backed by NumPy, uh, but you have poor integration uh, with other systems. In theory, uh, memory copy is very fast. Um, you have a little bit of D on serialization on top of it, but um, it shouldn't be that big of an issue. Um, if we go back um, two years in time, um, most of the time, uh, the solution for cross-language uh, data sharing was uh, you, we need to go with CSV, um, but CSV is not a file format. It's just text, and um, yeah, I don't like it. So um, the obvious solution um, is Parquet. Um, Parquet is a binary uh, columnar data format. Um, I'll give you a little bit of explanation what this means. So typical um, records that we operate on um, are always uh, like on this day, in this location, we have sold this amount of products. Um, of course, in our real machine learning pipelines, we have many more features, but it's always a little bit the same looking at this. So if you look at traditional um, database systems or the memory buffer, how it's stored, it's in a row-based fashion. So you write row after row uh, into your memory. Um, whereas uh, columnar storage takes a different approach. So it writes all um, the cells from uh, one column after it, and then the next column, and then the next column. Um, this uh, might not be the uh, optimal approach if you are only interested to work with one row, because then the traditional memory buffer, buffer is, is better. You can select one row and just read um, the records that uh, are with this row. Um, but the columnar storage is much more efficient if you want to work on huge blocks of your data um, because it, you can fetch all the data, it passes into the caches of your CPU, and you can um, uh, work with these blocks much better. So Parquet um, is a columnar storage. It was uh, started in 2012 by Cloudera and Twitter, so um, it's in the Hadoop ecosystem, uh, or the born in the Hadoop ecosystem. The first implementations were in Java, and um, the first 1.0 release was in 2013. Uh, it's now an Apache top-level um, project, and starting in fall 2016, uh, there was the first Python and C++ support. Um, at the moment, uh, in the Hadoop or in the big data Java ecosystem, it's the state-of-the-art uh, default I.O. option. So why should you use Parquet? Um, as I said earlier, it's a columnar format. It's um, very good for vectorized operations. Um, it has very efficient uh, encoding and compressions. Um, you can use predicted uh, pushdown to only read the data that you need. I'll tell you later a little bit more how this works. And it's a language independent format, so you have libs in Java, Scala, C++, and Python. Uh, a big advantage over, for example, CSV, uh, it's uh, that it's a splittable uh, format, so that you can only read parts um, of your file that you're interested in. So, for example, in CSV, you can't just uh, jump to uh, the row 100,000 and read a blog of it, and you have always to seek to all the data to see where you are. Um, the parquet is, is much better. Um, you had to have compression at a column level, um, especially with the column uh, format of your data. This is very e efficient. And you have also rich metadata, so you have a schema attached uh, to your file and statistics, um, which you can use um, to efficiently uh, read your data. At the moment, um, there are two implementations uh, that you can use uh, in Python to work uh, with Parquet. Uh, the one is the fast parquet library. Um, it's more from, from the Dask uh, people. Um, they have implemented it. And the other one is uh, the Apache Arrow project um, that's mostly driven by Wes McKinney. Um, what is Apache Arrow? So it's um, a specification for an in-memory columnar data format. So it maps very good to the parquet on disk file format. Um, 
it's a uh, language independent um, implementation of a memory uh, format. So um, the implementation is in C or C++, and you can expose um, the API to, to other um, programming languages. And so you can, uh, the um, support for Parquet was brought to Pandas um, in Parquet C++ uh, without any um, additional code uh, to read it, and you use, can use the Apache Arrow project um, with also other uh, technologies like Spark or Drill. So um, let's have a look at the Parquet file structure. Um, as I said, it's an on-disk format. Um, each file um, splits up into row groups. So a row groups are about um, five megabyte to one gigabyte of data, and it's a number from, I say, would say, 10,000 to 100,000 rows. Um, within a row group, you have column chunks. Um, so uh, it's a columnar file format, so for each column uh, you write the data for each record one after another. And then you have uh, the page units um, within a column uh, chunk that is used for compression um, and efficient uh, storage. And at the end of the file um, you have statistics. Um, this is uh, on the metadata of the file. This is a very nice feature because with this way um, you can stream uh, the data into a parquet file, um, just keep uh, records about um, the metadata and the statistics, and once you are done, um, just write the statistics, so you don't have to write the statistic at first, or even worse, keep all the data in memory before you uh, write it, but you can stream it out. Um, now, if you want to work uh, with Python and parquet file, how does this look like? Um, so it's um, very easy. You just have the pandas top level function read parquet. Um, you can either pass it um, a, a file handle or a file name. Um, and the first thing, if you are interested uh, in, uh, in, um, in effic efficient read uh, of parquet files is that you should only specify this, the columns that you are interested to read in. So if you have a, a parquet file with, like I said earlier, uh, five columns and you are only interested in the day and the sale, um, you know, if you pass it in, you will also only read the data from the disk um, from the columns that you have read, uh, that you have specified uh, in the column projection in the column order. Um, this is also a, fe a feature that I contributed to Pandas. Um, that's been my first uh, contribution to Pandas. I'm pretty proud of it, um, but it was basically just passing it through the underlying uh, libraries. Yeah, and as you can see, if you pass the columns, um, you will only read from the disk the columns um, that you requested. Uh, what's next, um, what you should uh, care about if you want to work with efficient, uh, with Parquet is predicate pushdown. So it also, uh, you don't not only want to read the columns that you are interested in, but also um, uh, split uh, data, uh, skip data that is not relevant for, relevant for you. Um, this saves, of course, I.O. load, uh, as the data does not need to be transferred, and um, this also saves CPU cycles um, because uh, the data does not need to be decoded. Um, example here, if you want to know um, which products um, are sold in dollars, um, you can only choose um, to select the columns, um, products, and um, the, the, um, the dollar um, column. And then you can filter out um, the euros, and if you have the statistics on, for the on-file um, representation, you can only read the cells that you are interested in. Um, predicate pushdown is at the moment uh, only available in the fast parquet uh, library uh, in, with the Python interface. Um, it's planned for PyArrow 2. It's already already there uh, in the underlying parquet C++ uh, implementation, but it's not yet uh, exposed um, to the um, API in Python or to pandas. Um, so what you can do, um, you can have a um, very um, yeah, easy filter syntax, so you can specify the column uh, an operation, uh, so equals, bigger, smaller, in, not in, and then a value. And this is then used um, to uh, skip uh, the reading of certain parts uh, in your file. 
Um, so let's have a look. Um, for an example, if you use, so you can switch uh, the engine between fast parquet uh, and pi arrow uh, in pandas to read from the files. So if you want to read um, the data and you are only um, interested in certain locations, um, you can use this um, to um, skip reading of whole row groups uh, and just uh, read the row group you are interested in. How is this done? Uh, if you write uh, the data to a parquet file, it also writes uh, statistics and metadata about the row groups. Um, so for example, here it writes for every uh, column uh, the min and the max values. And if you read this metadata first, um, then you can use this uh, to skip the whole row group if it doesn't match your predicate. Um, this works only very good if you work on, cert, uh, on sorted um, data, because otherwise, uh, if you have randomly distributed columns, um, more or less in each row group, you will have um, the min-max values from your whole distribution of your data. So um, if you want to use this feature, um, you should make sure that if you write the data to disk that it's in a sorted order, and then this will really speed up um, your, your, your read. Um, but otherwise, um, you won't uh, gain that much. Um, another trick uh, that you can use on the one hand um, to minimize the data storage size on disk and also to speed up reading later is to use dictionary encoding. Um, this is a very good fit for pandas categoricals. Um, so if you have, for example, um, for your product, um, the color of your product, and it's always from the same category, like blue, red, blue, yellow, um, you can, can use a dictionary encoding, and you can specify this, and Parquet will then store the um, data with your dictionary encoding on disk. So you only uh, store the name of your value once, and then just um, store pointers uh, to the value. And this is much more efficient. And on top of this, you also could uh, use run, run length encoding on the values. So you, this will also get smaller. And then um, if you want to filter again uh, based on, on the color, or here I, I have the example was a sales type, and then you can just check uh, in the dictionary for this row group if um, your predicate um, matches this row group, then reach, uh, read the data and otherwise not read it. So uh, basically the dictionary encoding, you can work with it like a bloom filter, but you don't have the false positives. Um, it works, um, the, 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 the performance penalty for adding uh, dictionaries is not that, that, that high, it's just about 1% of the reading, um, reading time. Um, to, uh, to use it, all uh, the values in the column need to be dictionary encoded, so for all row groups and all page chunks really must use the dictionary encoding. Um, and this is especially helpful if you um, have not uh, sorted um, the column, so you still can benefit from partial reading of your data. So again, um, if you look at the um, dictionary of each row group first, and then you can decide, okay, to skip a whole row group um, and not read it from disk, and this will massively speed up your applications. Um, beside um, compression um, and encoding on a column level, um, Parquet has compression on the whole Parquet file. Um, so you can uh, shrink the data independent of its content. Um, it's more uh, CPU intensive than the encoding. Um, but encoding and compression uh, works better than compression alone, and um, available are GZIP, Snappy, and Broadly. Uh, Broadly is uh, the newest one of the compression um, engines. Um, if you don't want to go deep in what, what compression engine is the best for your data, um, just stick, uh, stick with Snappy. Um, that's what we have seen. Here are some uh, storage comparisons uh, that we have done. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's based from the New York taxi data uh, records. Um, the columns are, I think, a bool, a daytime, a float, and an int. And we have tried to um, yeah, store it in different, uh, in different formats. And 
you see with Parquet, um, you are really uh, you have a compression of factor 10, uh, and you still um, read it much faster than, for example, CSV. Another trick uh, that we very often use, and this time we'll switch to Dask, um, is data partitioning. So until now, uh, we have always uh, read uh, from one file and just read parts of a file. Uh, this is fine if you work on a lo local machine or work with the data only from one consumer. Um, but as soon as you have a distributed system and work with multiple consumers and especially with multiple produ producers, uh, it makes sense uh, to split the data into multiple files. Um, there is, it's not a really a standard, but it's uh, based on the Hive partitioning scheme so that you basically uh, encode um, the partitioning scheme in your file name or in the path. So for example, so we have a directory date 2070-0101 and another directory within it location equals location zero and then you have multiple uh, parts of your Parquet files. And with uh, Dask, you can create uh, this kind of structure, but also Dask can be used to auto-detect uh, the structure and read the data back in. So you just handle into Dask uh, a directory, and it also, um, yeah, it recognizes the structure of the da directory, and you can also uh, use predicates um, to, um, predicate push down in this, uh, in this way to only read the files where the predicate of your file pass match. Um, if you're working in a distributed system, um, soon or sooner or later you have to move away from your local computer uh, and split computation from storage. Um, the approach that we uh, did was, um, so we didn't want to host the HDFS file system on, on our own, so um, we are running on Azure. And then we decided to use the Azure Blob Storage um, to store all our data, uh, all the Parquet files. Um, uh, you can pass into to, to Parquet or the Tupai Arrow um, either a file handle uh, or a local file or something that behaves um, like a Python file ob object. Um, so this is an example if you just uh, get a a stream or a file object from the blob blob service. This is the way how to access uh, Azure blob storage. Then pass it into the Parquet read table um, and then go uh, to Pandas and to get the data into Pandas. Um, this uh, works very well if you want to work with the whole data. Um, but you lose, if you uh, take the streaming approach, uh, you use all the benefits that I explained before, um, that with predicate push down and only to read the data you're interested in. So we have also um, written um, an interface for um, the Azure Blob Storage that um, implements um, the Python file uh, interface. Um, so we have an IO interface where you can tell, where you can seek, where you can read. Um, we have open sourced it at par, uh, um, as part um, of the Simple KV library. Um, so Simple KV as an abstraction layer over different um, storage technologies. And yeah, this helps us um, to gain the benefit um, of predicate pushdown um, and also uh, store the data um, on a remote file system. Uh, Another real life uh, improvement uh, that we have seen with Apache Arrow. Um, so as I told earlier, uh, our architecture is that we uh, need to, use, uh, to get the data out of the database and then analyze it in pandas. Um, the data in the database is stored in a columnar uh, form. Um, until two years ago, if we wanted to pull uh, the data out, um, we used uh, PyODBC um, as a layer uh, to talk to the database but PyODBC uh, works in a row-wise form, so all the data was uh, transferred from a column and data storage um, to the row-wise, and then um, when we passed it into Pandas, um, it was again converted from the row-wise to the column-wise. What we did, and probably what uh, many people do if they want to work with data in Pandas, um, yeah, take the ugly real-life solution that was to export the data from the database as CSV, bypass ODBC uh, in total, and then read it back into CSV. Uh, yeah, but CSV, you, all, you lose all the type information, and it's just a hack. Uh, it's not a, a real thing how to do it. Um, so what was um, our solution? Um, 
one of my colleagues, Michael Koenig, um, he implemented TurboDBC. That's an ODBC um, implementation for Python that can also work with columnar data and also supports the Apache Arrow uh, standard. So you can get the data from the database in a columnar fashion and then expose batches um, of PyArrow tables um, to, the Py to the Python world and you could either then write it away as Parquet again with nearly zero uh, memory transformations or you can get it into Pandas and then work with this. Um, if you are more interested in, about, in this technology or TurboDBC uh, in general, um, you can see the talk from Michael Koenig last year at the PyCon, or you can check out our tech blog where he has some really um, deep dive um, how, how he implemented uh, this. So um, where are we now? Um, so we moved away from the direct access to the database because it was uh, the bottleneck, so we now um, export the data from the database into the Azure Blob storage. And then from there, uh, we, run, we run our machine learning models. Um, this is now the huge benefit that we really can scale out our machine learning models um, because the Azure Blob storage uh, scales much, much better um, than our uh, database. And the same thing with inserts um, on, on the Azure Blob storage. We don't have to synchronize the inserts um, every, every job can just insert into, into one blob, and then we uh, can um, work uh, on the data to get it back to the customer. Also a nice benefit is that we now use um, a file format that, it sh that is shared uh, by different implementations that we can now also use Hive, Pesto, or Drill um, to do analysis um, of the data, and that we don't have to store these large time series uh, in our in-memory database, which is much more expensive uh, than the Azure Blob Storage. So the Azure Blob Storage um, for terabytes, it's not even yeah, I don't, 10 or 15 euros, so that's that's nothing. And the um, the query engines uh, on the on the bottom right, these are ones that you can fire up for the analysis, and once you are done down, you can fire them down again, and you don't have to pay um, like the uh, database um, the whole day uh, to keep it running. So what we have learned uh, is safe uh, in one, load in another ecosystem. Um, this really helps us, um, but always persist the intermediate data. Um, so if you are interested in this topic too, uh, there are still lots of stuff to do um, in the Apache Parquet um, project, but also in the Arrow project. There are still lots of functions that are not yet uh, exposed to Python or Pandas or Dask. So um, yeah, some of my colleagues um, are Apache um, members and they work on this project, but uh, there's still lots of things to do. Um, that's it. Um, this was my talk, um, using Pandas and Dask to work with large column uh, data sets. So if you have any questions, feel free um, to ask me now or later, or just uh, ping me at the conference. If you have questions, uh, can you quill on this side of the room, please? I'm really happy I sit on the left side of the room. Um, thanks. I, I remember two years ago, you were also at EuroPython, but you were talking about Spark. Yes. PySpark back then. Yeah. Now I see a sta picture of your stack that doesn't have PySpark anymore, nope. but it's replaced with Dask. Yeah. Um, so just a th question in that sense, Dask is ready for prime time? Uh, not, I would not say not yet. Um, so just go back to PySpark. Um, also with Arrow, PySpark has really improved, or the Python access in inside Spark has really improved. Um, also two years ago, if you go from the JVM world to the Python world, you have very expensive encoding and decoding every value, and it was really that slow that basically you can't use it at all. Um, I think with Spark 2.3, they have also introduced Arrow uh, for the conversation so that now you can work in PySpark, in Python, um, with, or to get Pandas results, and the whole serialization is done in Arrow. Um, so it's much faster now, but two years ago it wasn't available, so we went uh, for the Dask direction. Um, we are still not using Dask everywhere in production, so we still have an own scheduler and some own libraries, uh, but we plan to do it and 
we do it because it's much more lightweight and much more fits into our stack because we are a Python company. So and, that's, and everything can still be Python. Which yeah, also also that's the reason for us. The footprint of Dask is much, um, much smaller than, than PySpark. Well, fair enough. Thanks. If you have a question, you need to come here. We're not passing the microphone. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Turbo DBC uh, thing. Have you tried to use the support for SQL Alchemy in Pandas to, to actually get the data like that? So we, we uh, Turbo, C, Turbo DBC also works nicely with um, SQL uh, Alchemy, uh, but you always, so SQL Alchemy is, also, you can use it um, from Pandas, but you always need the driver below uh, to talk to the database, and we either use uh, Turbo DBC or PyODBC, and that's the thing that is fast or slow. Um, so if you want to use SQL Alchemy in Pandas, that's just a layer, layer above um, the, the other stuff. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have some questions from my practical user case. Um, uh, there's one, st in our you know, data pipeline flow, there's one step we need to read in the, the file which is in nested JSON, JSON format. Nested in JSON format. So the first time we try to use a pandas, pandas, you know, read JSON, read JSON. But the JSON, that function cannot handle the nested, the problem. So, so the solution is, um, Quite an uh, Basically, I have to write the like uh, internal very static um, static, uh, uh, static library myself to handle these streams. But uh, you know, all these data streams are kind of stable, so make uh, a transfer them to the uh, pandas data frame. So I was thinking um, whether in future you want you you can or you would like to think about to maybe adding the feature like uh, reading in the nested JSON. So the, maybe the solution could be, firstly, you, you have an analysis, the structure of the JSON to identify what is going on, and then you use some like a string cutting mechanism. I mean, it's from my, yeah. it's my temporary solution for that. Yeah. So uh, basically, uh, Parquet um, supports nested data structures. Nested. Uh, nested. So in the Parquet files, you can really store nested data structures. Like um, nested JSON, something like that. Yeah, as a, not JSON, but nested data structures. Parquet can handle this, but I don't think this will be exposed to Python, uh, uh, to Pandas, Pandas, because Pandas is a tabulary uh, two-dimensional um, yeah, interface. Yeah. So it doesn't the, fit that well to, to nested the, the data. Reason, the, the reason is because the, the nested JSON it, uh, we, it will finally turn out to be a two-dimensional. Okay. So is, that's why I think it would be, be good to consume you know, and the transfer direct to data frame. That's why I, I write a library to, I mean, it's an internal library to directly transfer this JSON, nested JSON file to a data frame and pass to pandas then following yeah, okay. in the future. I think that's so the way to go, uh, like you did it, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Do we have another question? Then I worked, so let's go uh, downstairs and okay. storm the buffet. So uh, I want to thank you again, uh, Peter, for the nice presentation.